Kirksville, Missouri. A community rich with history and time-honored tradition. Home to generations of students and families alike. But what chilling secrets might be lurking just below the surface of this small town? Uh, there were many times I stood in that hallway late at night, just hoping to get a glimpse of those dancing lines. She said it was like a shadow, but in the middle of the room. It was always weird that he was just staring at my window when there was nobody in there. I once thought I saw a woman while sitting in the devil's chair. I looked away for a second, and I couldn't find her when I turned back. Sometimes late at night, you'd hear a violin playing up on the third floor. People in the dorms talk about hearing knocking and scratching when nobody's there, or just the feeling of being watched. Kirksville is a very creepy place. Join us as we explore the dark, the strange, and the unexplained. Join us as we hear the unsettling tales of encounters with the unknown, and the truth behind Kirksville's most hair-raising destinations. Join us for Kirksville Creeps. The most commonly reported site of strange happenings is one that nearly every Truman student has spent significant time in, the residence halls. From items being moved with no explanation to hearing voices coming from empty rooms, almost everyone has at least one story to tell. One day I saw my friend who has a dog, like his dog was sitting outside my room and I noticed him sitting outside and I went to go check on him to see if he was good, if he was lost. Because I know he liked to walk around a lot, but he was just sitting outside my, out my window, staring up at it, like staring up at me almost. And I got dressed, went outside, like went to go tend to the dog, see if it was good, and it, I couldn't get its attention. I like snapped, I whistled, called his name, and he was just still staring right up at my window, which is on the second floor of Dobson. And I tried to move him, he just wouldn't move. It was kind of weird how like he wouldn't move his gaze from that one spot. Like something was m moving in the room. My roommate didn't sleep in the room a lot last year, um, and I was going in and out of class a lot. So it was always weird that he was just staring at my window when there was nobody in there. This was about early August, my freshman year, and it's 9.30ish at night, and I'm walking by Grim Hall, and suddenly the air just drops 20 degrees. And I have no idea what's going on. And then I turn to Grim Hall, and I see something like in the window, like a pair of eyes looking at me. And then like, I turned away for like a fraction of a second. When I looked back, it was gone. I can still see the eyes. It was, it was pretty weird. Stories of unexplained events are not limited to Truman's dorms. Some take place in older buildings, such as Baldwin Hall. What I would call, yeah, a pretty significant one for me, I suppose. Uh, I mean, in the telling, it's not really that interesting or exciting, but to me it was pretty substantial because there was no explanation behind it. And it happened right out here in the auditorium. As you're looking at the audience on the right side, over in the wings, there's a room we call the Patch Bay. In this room, we keep equipment. I was working late one night. We were getting ready for a lyceum. It was about 1, 1.30 in the morning. I had let the crew go, and then I was just finishing up a couple of things. So I was by myself. So I had uh, I hit the lights in the odd. Then I went to the double doors exit, at which point I, my, my periphery, I saw underneath the door of the patch bay that the lights were still on, all right? And so, in spite of the fact that it was maybe, you know, 12 feet away, I just kind of looked at it, I went uh, like that, and I went out, closed it, locked it, came into the office here, get my stuff together. Then I remember I left my clipboard out there, so I went to get it. I opened the door to go out in the yard, and the first thing I noticed was that the light in the patch bay was off. It was dark. And so I stood there looking at it for a minute, and I was thinking, well, okay, I suppose it's just barely possible the light bulb showed that minute and a half to finally burn out. So I went over to it, I reached around, and sure enough, the light switch was down. I flicked it up, the light was on. 
minute and a half I already locked up every other door. Uh, I wish to hell we'd had the surveillance cameras at that time so we would have been able to see for sure. But the, the reason I say it's significant is because rather than just my imagination, I actually made a physical response to it. Right? When I looked at it, I actually went like that. So it's not as if I just imagined something. Okay? It was there, it was on. When I came back a minute and a half later, it was off. So I like to think that the ghost was helping me out. One of Truman's most popular horror destinations, especially around Halloween, is found in the Highland Park Cemetery. It is known as the Devil's Chair. The legend with the Devil's Chair is that if you sit in, on it on midnight, anytime besides Halloween, if you're worthy, like a good person, then you won't go to hell. But if you are a bad person, then you'll get dragged down to hell. But if you sit on it, on Halloween at midnight, then you'll automatically get dragged down to hell. I'm sure there's different variations on the story, but the most popular theme is if you sit in the chair under a full moon, then you will die within a month. Folklorists talk about talk about people acting out their folklore when there's a, when the folklore involves a, a component of people doing something like going to train bridge. Um, that's called ostension, and and uh, specifically going someplace that's associated with, with a legend. It's called legend tripping. And the, the highlight legend tripping destination for Kirksville, um, and it, it's especially a matter of, of this for college students, is, is the Baird Chair Monument in the, in the Highland Park Cemetery. The, the students have, have uh, a legend that has two variations. Um, it's always the same, you have to go visit the chair, at midnight. Now it might be Halloween, it might be New Year's Eve, and if you sit on the chair at midnight either something terrible happens because you've offended the spirits um, or something wonderful happens because you've been bold, you've been brave. Um, and those that's the way that stories always branch in folklore. It actually isn't a gravestone, it's, it's, simply, it's simply a monument and and uh, many years ago, I tracked down a newspaper, newspaper story from the 1890s in the Kirksville Daily Express that talked about um, an interesting chair sculpture that was on display in a downtown shop. Um, that was, and the, uh, the shop actually belonged to this stonecutter, Mr. Baird. And this was, this was simply a, a decorative ornament that he made. Um, it also belongs to a really large class of objects that get called devil's chairs all over the Midwest. And they're really intended, they were originally intended, for people to come and sit on them and, and meditate and remember their loved ones. College towns often have, often have some spooky lore associated with them. College towns almost always develop a certain number of ghost stories. Um, and the general thinking is that because, because college students are not really rooted in the community, um, building those traditions helps them, helps them imagine themselves as, as being more rooted and gives them more of a feeling of, of being at home, simply that they have their own traditions. Of the traditions passed down the generations of Truman students, exploring the old cemeteries around Kirksville has been a long-standing favorite. One cemetery in particular, Sloan's Point, carries with it a haunting legend. So all I know is that a few miles outside of town, there's a cemetery full of kids and babies, and it's really sad if you think about it. So you're supposed to go full into the cemetery, shut the gate, then you're supposed to go down to the bottom of the hill, and by the tree, there's like a set of like triplets that died at the same time from like, you know, 40, 50 years ago. And you're supposed to stay there and like look at their graves and like, talk to them and stuff and just like walk around and be away from your car for like 20 minutes or something and then theoretically you're supposed to come back and there's supposed to be baby handprints all over your car and my best friend's mom did it and she is like pretty superstitious about that stuff so and it was true like she kept the handprints on her car for like a week or so after so I saw them in their pictures and stuff and she like washed her car before so it's like where did the dust come from like where are these handprints Creepy business. <laughs> like so many cemeteries of that era, 
the mortality rate for children was not really great. So, of course, there's a lot of children buried there, which is the case in any old cemetery. But for that one has somehow gotten this legend that they're, they're child ghosts. And they, some call it the child cemetery, but it's, it's, not, it's, it's just a normal cemetery. Which an interesting fact about that one, we also did research on that. In the historical museum, Kirksville Historical, there is a photograph of the residents of Sloan's Point. All the residents of Sloan's Point, which no longer exists, was right down on the Sheraton River, they had all gone to Novinger to have their picture taken together as a town. And so you look at this picture and then you can find some of the names on the headstones in the cemetery. Yeah, it's pretty amazing. A Truman student, who preferred to be unnamed, shared their knowledge of a grisly murder that occurred just a few miles away from Kirksville. The student writes, There is a spot right out of town where an old man died. He was a grumpy dude that used to flash cash all around town. One night, a group of five or six kids, ages 17 to 21, broke into his house to rob him. They tied him to a bed and tortured him to find out where he kept his safe. They got the money and then burned the house down with him inside, alive. We discussed this student story with Randy Bame, who is familiar with this uncommon Kirksville legend. Yeah, that was all true from the research that uh, I've done with it and we did for the film that we made about it. Randy showed us an article that was published by the Southeast Missourian in 2002, a few months after the murder of Frank B. Schimmick in the small, now long-abandoned town of Goldsbury. Strangely, the majority of the article was of Goldsbury locals complaining about Frank Schimmick rather than the details of his murder. In life, Schimmick was strongly disliked by his neighbors, one of whom described him as the meanest, most unhappy man. The article was also vague about the details of Schimmick's death, claiming he was fatally shot before the fire was set to his home. Yeah, I, I, there's some definitely some conflict there, but it also in that original article it, it does um, suggest that it was something more than that when they say no matter what kind of person he was, no one should die that way. So it, it certainly suggests it was more than just being shot, uh, which made it you know a really gruesome kind of crime. Just down the road from the location of Frank Schimmick's brutal murder is a cluster of abandoned Goldsberry homes. Due to a fallen tree, the most striking and mysterious of these was too dangerous for our reporters to investigate. Randy, however, has already been inside. Well, I've been there many times, is what I gotta tell you. So, I mean, the first time I discovered the place was uh, a lot of years ago. I wanna say it was probably about 09, somewhere in there, and went into the big two-story house, the first one, it was nighttime. I had seen the other ones as we were coming down the road, all right? So what it was is we'd been to dinner in Macon at the Pear Tree, and we were coming back down the uh, side roads and stuff, and as we're going along on this highway, I look over to the side, and I just have to notice this, oh, there's an abandoned house, and I love abandoned houses, exploring them. And then immediately, then there was another one, and I'm thinking, oh, wow. And then immediately there was another one. I'm thinking, oh, this is just too much. And then right across the street was this big two-story house just looming out of nowhere. I thought, okay, that's it. i got to stop right now. And so explored that one with the intention of coming back and exploring the others. And when I did that, that's when I, I discovered that there was even more houses than I thought and then made the realization that this was actually a town because the, street, or the, the, the city limit signs were still there. And oddly enough, they didn't look old at all. They looked rather new. And so this then intrigued me. So uh, I told some friends about it, and we started exploring. And in the process of this, I found some pretty cool stuff that I've collected over the years. I collect mason jars. There is one of the houses that does have a bunch of jars with stuff still in it, which is really looks gross, and I couldn't even begin to tell you where it is. But the house housed about a dozen or so hospital beds. So when I first saw this, I was thinking, okay, this was an old house at one time, but then there were clear signs, very recent signs at that time of a renovation happening. And then if you look in where the room where you go in to the side of the house, the first one, 
there was a very long stainless steel sink um, that was there at the time when I was there. So it made me think that this was kind of at one time a convalescent home or something like that. It's where old folks would probably go, you know, or sick people, a place that they would look kind of nice. <laughs> That's what I thought. But then I found out that it was not, in fact, something like that, that the guy who had owned the house, for reasons that nobody really knew, had purchased all of these hospital beds and stored them there. And it seemed, it seemed very bizarre, because there was, uh, at that time, there must have been at least three or four on the front porch, two in the living room, two in the other living area parlor, let's call it, where there was and may still be an old player piano. Um, but it just, it still seemed like it was probably a convalescent home or something like that. But very, very little information I've been able to find through the years about Goldsbury and why and what happened. But the one thing is for sure, with the exception of about one house, all the others, they just left everything and left. Um, pretty bizarre. If we go into all the different houses, the one thing that is consistent you will find is that any piece of mail that was left behind, any magazine, the final dates seem to be around 95. And then all of a sudden it's gone. In the sleepy town of Kirksville, such stories are in every old house, every gnarled tree, in every hallway of Truman's dorms. Whether you believe in the paranormal, or you've encountered the unknown and unexplained, there will always be the hair-raising tales to be heard of the darkest corners of Kirksville's past. And in this remote college town, Halloween is truly something special.